Well, here we are. Final night, final message. Got our panelists coming up here in a bit. Dreams have become reality. And what was just once a, a thought in a couple of minds has come to fruition. And I'm glad to have journeyed with you this week, those of you that are here in person and those of you that are watching online. It's my hope and prayer that as we finish up this week in a focus on Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, that you're left with infinite hope. There's something that you can pull out of the messages, the discussion, the conversation, the time spent in Scripture that you can step away and say, yeah, I got a glimpse of infinite hope. And here we are at the finish. Wrapped up the Beatitudes this morning. Now we're turning to salt and light. It's as if Jesus in his unpacking and his description of the kingdom of God says this is what the kingdom of God looks like and now this is what the kingdom of God must do. Because it is not enough to just passively sit by in the kingdom of God. Yes, all are welcome. The gates are open. Please come in. But we've got something for you to do. There's purpose. There's meaning. There's calling. We've talked through those Beatitudes. That group that Jesus says are blessed. That, that motley crew. That ragtag bunch of ragamuffins. And we've turned. The community has become seasoning. Salt worth its value. And now the community must become visible. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As we open scripture, let's bow our heads for one more word of prayer. God of promise, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for providing infinite hope for our lives. As we look at these words about being the light of the world, God, may you shine forth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have you ever been in complete darkness? And I'm not just talking about when you turn the lights off in your bedroom and go to sleep at night. No, a darkness that is so devoid of light that the darkness feels palpable, that it's covering you. And some of you are like, yeah, that was Tuesday this week. <laughs> I think it was a spring, spring break. My, my parents can fact check me on this. But growing up, our, our family liked to travel, see the, the great outdoors and experience the diverse beauty of the North American continent. And it was on one of those trips that we made our way to the Carlsbad Caverns National Park, a sprawling expanse located in southeastern New Mexico, nestled within the Guadalupe Mountains. It's known for its limestone formation, spectacular stalagmites and stalactites. It was into the cave we ventured caref on carefully curated concrete paths and walkways with electric light bulbs. Praise God for technology, right? We were guided in our descent into the dark underworld. And of course, we had a tour guide that was showing us the way. And part of that tour took us into a place that they affectionately named the Big Room. It's a space probably about as big as, as the room that we are in now. So imagine stalactites and stalagmites in this space and formations, and you're several hundred feet underneath the ground wondering if the roof is going to hold up, of course. It's a dim glow of lights that are cast on the path, and they're casting shadows across the walls and the ceilings, and there's towering formations everywhere we turned. 
And as we settled into that space, finding seats on benches hewn from the cave floor, the tour guide came over and approached my parents and I and asked me if I'd like to be the one to turn the lights off. Every 10-year-old's dream, right? Of course I'd like to turn the lights off. Let's do it. So she took me over to where the button was and told me where to sit and told me what the cue was. She had a run sheet. No, she didn't have a run sheet. But she had it all mapped out. She says, when I say this particular word, I want you to turn, to, to press the button and turn the lights completely out. And so there I sat, a group of 40 or 50 in this tour. I was off in the corner anxiously waiting for my cue. Anxious anticipation as it, as it came and the, the command came on cue and I hit the button and all of a sudden the lights went out. And there we all sat in silence and darkness. There was no light anywhere that we could see. It was so dark that you could literally put your hand in front of your face like this and you could not see it. You could feel the sound waves bouncing off of your hand, but you could not physically see your hand in front of your face. The darkness seemed to pervade the deepest, deepest depths of our souls. And in the dark, the tour guide told us about how explorers had found this cave. And how they had ventured into its deep, dark blackness by lantern, and by candlelight. And then the tour guide reached into her pocket. Well, I mean, at least I think she did. The lights were off, so I don't know. It sounded like it. She pulled out a single match. And in the midst of that dark expanse, she struck the match with a light sound and a spark. And the entire expanse of the cave was illuminated by the light of one tiny matchstick. One small light. Insignificant to the sun that burned miles above our heads, one small light transformed complete darkness into a space that was inhabitable. You see, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. In Greek, you in this case is y'all. It's plural. If Jesus was telling the Sermon on the Mount on a Texas hillside, he would have said, y'all are the light of the world. And he would have looked around at all of y'all, all y'all, all right? And I imagine for a moment that he pauses and he makes eye contact with every single person that's sitting there. It's, I don't know, 2,000 people. It took him a little bit. Looking at each person present there on that hillside, trying to, to make ends meet. He sees the starving artist. He sees the single mom. He sees the young business entrepreneur wondering if he's made the right decision. He sees the grandfather and grandmother that are being taken care of by their children. He sees the Roman soldier shifting uneasily at the sight of the crowd. And he sees those religious leaders watching his every mood. He sees the poor in spirit. He sees those who mourn, the mink, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. They're all there. And he's looking at all of them. And it's to this group that he says, all y'all are the light of the world. He's unfolding for them a mission and a calling, and he wants you. You see, the burden is placed on the hearers of the word of the gospel of the kingdom. And the same word that went forth from Jesus' mouth in this point in time goes forth to us today. Y'all are the light of the world. And we're in Texas, so we can say it that way, right? You see, it's the collective body, the beatitudes, the blessed ones, those people are the light. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Being the light of the world is something present. It's current. It's in the present tense. Something that's happening now, not something you become, not something you achieve, 
And Jesus unequivocally states that this group of blessed ones are the light of the world. Their current state of being is reflecting light to those around them. It's not that they were once light or that they will become the light after going through Jesus' boot camp on the mount. No, 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 no. They are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Isn't it interesting that we describe darkness in terms of the absence of light? There's no opposite word than to just describe the absence of light. That's what darkness is. Light is the created thing. Darkness is the absence then thereof. Jesus himself came professing in John chapter 8 that he is the light of the world and now he is sharing that role with his disciples. He says, it's you and me. You're the light of the world. And light throughout scripture is used to represent God's presence. It's, it's his being. It's his entrance into a space. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the first thing he spoke into existence was light. The very first primary creation was light. Light is one of the main ways that we experience the world around us. Yes, sound, touch, smell, and taste are very important, but light gives us the ability to see the world around us. Light can be bent and bounced and transformed in a myriad of different ways. And we use it here in this space. You can look around and see a menagerie of different colors that change over time. There's hues and shades and intensities and directions that we try to foster an atmosphere that allows you to focus where you need to focus and mitigate against distraction. Light provides guidance, clarity, and safety. Sometimes we take our light and hide it from others. Jesus says that's of no use. No one takes a candle and puts it underneath a bushel. No, 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 the light must go forth to everyone that's around. You know, we, we put our light under something, right? You can't know that I'm too Christian. You can't know that I'm too Adventist, that I like haystacks and eat weird veggie meat. That might be a turnoff, right? But what if what we believe is not worth believing to the full? To the point that we can't live out what we believe. Is it worth believing? That if we can't own the gospel and carry it to every point of our lives, is it worth spending this significant amount of time that we do in this space and claiming to follow Jesus if the light of the gospel has not pervaded to the deepest parts of our soul? And by the way, for Jesus to say the light, he gets specific. It's not just you are a light in the world and like, cool, we can all get together, carry our lights around and sing kumbaya. No, 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 no. You are the light of the world. Later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will will tell us the significance of this light. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 23 said, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus seems to say the things that we take in, the light that we allow to pass through our two eyeballs and our heads affects what's on the inside of us and then in turn affects what we reflect through those around us. Jesus says the things that we behold affect the light that is within us. And this is where the rubber meets the road. You are the light of the world. There's a world that needs light. The light has purpose and direction in the same way that you cannot hide a city that's on a hill or it's foolishness to cover up a lamp. Jesus says that light goes out into the world. The light illuminates the darkness. It shines and radiates the grace and the peace and the love of a father who desires relationship. It makes known the length that God would go to save the world. Why do we sit back and not let our lights shine forth? 
The world is not in need of more methods and people who have all the right words to say every time something goes wrong or the right explanation about the inter- interpretation of some obscure prophecy from Second Hesitations chapter four. No, the world is in need of men and women who will let their light shine. If you're broken, tell somebody. You're mourning, tell somebody. You're searching after righteousness, hungering and thirsting for it, tell somebody. The blessedness of the Beatitudes will speak for itself. There's a reason Jesus says that those groups are blessed living under the Sermon on the Mount and the blessings of the Beatitudes will change your life. And it will change those around you as well. You see, the blessing of the Beatitudes is found in sharing your experience. We come together in community. We mourn our brokenness. We hunger and thirst after God. We encourage each other on so that we might not have a divided but a pure heart. We seek to make peace and when the persecution comes, we know that it's for Jesus' name's sake and we are following after him. The blessings of the Beatitudes is found in sharing your experience with those around you. The light is not hidden so that all in the house can experience it. So where do I find hope? I find hope in a God who will use a matchstick of a life like mine to illuminate the world around me. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine.